Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. I'm Tony Marcolini. I'm here with my co-host, Seamus McDonough, the handsome gentleman <laughs> to the left. Um, okay. And also joining us today is a very special guest, uh, author and scholar, uh, Stephen J. Rubin. Hi, Steve. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, I've taken, I've, I have to admit, I've read your James Bond book. I've only skimmed your Twilight Zone book, uh, but I read enough of the Twilight Zone. I think I'm going to start there because I expect to spend more time on uh, on James Bond. But I did want to touch upon the Twilight Zone because I was struck by an analogy that you made, or uh, I guess credit that you threw uh, to uh, like Edgar Allan Poe. Um, in in the sense of he was the first to bring together, uh, you know, science fiction and fantasy and horror and put it together in some entertainment form. Uh, so long before the Twilight Zone, you know, was on TV, there were these great 19th century authors who kind of brought that together. And I really, it had never dawned on me. I would have never put the literary connection together with the two, but you're so right. No, I, I think that, um, well, certainly Rod Serling, who I would argue was the most famous American author of the last half of the 20th century, and I believe his work should be studied like we study Edgar Allan Poe and Fitzgerald and H. Hemingway. H. Wells. I think H.G. Wells, Wells was another one of your analogies, of course. Oh, absolutely. I, well, first of all, Rod uh, was a voracious reader starting from when he was a little boy. So he was influenced by these classic authors. And I think by the time The Twilight Zone went on the air in 1959, uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror was still a bit of the orphan in the room when it came to popular entertainment. Yes, there were science fiction films. Certainly there were many of them made in the 1950s, but it wasn't considered a classic genre of storytelling, at least in the 50s on film. I think what Rod Serling did was he brought the medium to television at a time when there was almost no science fiction, fantasy and horror on television. And I think that uh, he, um, he did something that those writers, Edgar Allan Poe, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, did sure. back in their day, that he popularized the genre. And at virtually every film, television show, book, etc., that's been written in the last hundred years has to have been inspired by the work of Rod. Oh, I would, I would definitely agree. Um, do you have a favorite? I know it's really hard to narrow it down, but... Uh, you, I'm, I'm certain you've seen them all. Do you have a favorite Twilight Zone episode? Well, I have to say, every time I see Burgess Meredith going into the bank vault to take his lunch, so it's the only place he could read without somebody screaming at him, uh, it's called uh, Time Enough at Last. That has to be one of my favorites. I have about 20 favorites. There are, there are 156 Twilight Zones in the classic original series. Uh, I had, as part of my research for the Twilight Zone Encyclopedia, was I had to watch every episode in order. It took me about four That's months. And by watching them in order, you're overwhelmed by the quality. As Rod said in his original presentation to CBS, these are little movies. It wasn't a typical TV series. And of course it was an anthology series. They had to kind of reinvent the wheel every week. So the quality for these movies, particularly in the episodes that were shot on film, which is 150 of the 156. Unfortunately, James Aubrey, the um, controversial head of CBS at the time wanted to save money in the second season. So he insisted that Rod shoot six on videotape and they actually, they actually sound awful today. They, I mean, excuse me, they look awful today because they were shot on videotape and not, not the current videotape we use, but, but the videotape of 1950s technology. I mean, I find that really interesting that you, you had to watch them in order. Um, I would have never given that any thought whatsoever. I mean, you know, you catch a rerun, uh, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of them obviously as well, but certainly I would think 
seeing them in order gives it new perspective. Well, fortunately, uh, with the release of all the episodes first on DVD and then Blu-ray, I think that it, it kind of, as the as the scholar, as the researcher, I had to really watch them as they were presented to gauge the quality. And you know, whereas today you're lucky to get 22 episodes in a season in a regular television series, back in the 1950s and early 60s, they could have as many as 35 to 36 episodes in one season. So by the end of season three, there were well over 100 episodes that had been released. Does the storytelling get better? Well, the storytelling, uh, the quality is maintained. I'm not going to tell you that all 156 are great because they're not. There are a few <laughs> that are a little uh, sour notes. But overall, the quality was very good. You know, in the fourth season, they had canceled the show. So basically, actually at the end of the third season. So basically... Uh, CBS put on this rather forgotten television series called Fair Exchange, which was anything but because it bombed in the ratings and James Aubrey, who was very much against anthology, had to call Rod Serling up and ask him for a mid-season replacement episode of the show. And that's where they made those 18 one-hour episodes because they didn't have, they didn't have, um, Excuse me, I need to take some water. They didn't have time to do a full season. Well, I mean, I certainly think that, uh, you know, the show, when I was little, I can remember watching it. I mean, and it was, it's scary. <laughs> you know, it's, it was a scary, for me, it was scary when I was a, a kid. Uh, I think I grew a, an appreciation for it, even as a genre, um, the older the older I got, but when I was young, I just saw it as something, you know, scary. Well, you um, and me both, you and me both, because I wandered into my parents' living room uh, one night. I knew nothing about the Twilight Zone. I was seven years old and they were watching, they were watching an episode called The Silence, which is about a bet that's made in a, um, in a private club between an old uh, member and a, what they call a motor mouth, a guy who would not shut up. So basically what happened was he bet him $500,000 that he couldn't shut up for a whole year. And when I heard that they were going to put this guy in a glass cabinet in the basement and he couldn't talk for a year, I left the room and I never came back. So I never <laughs> saw this Twilight Zone again until it came to reruns. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 as a seven-year-old, I was pretty much freaked out by that mm -hmm. whole concept. <laughs> Isn't it captivated. Amazing? Yeah, they do it, right? Seamus, they do it like the horror is in your mind. They make you use your imagination to scare mm -hmm. you more than it's it's not like a the horror movies now where there's blood and you know chainsaws and you know, there's a lot of gore. Uh, I mean, they made you use your imagination to scare yourself. No, it's very true. Thrillers, yeah. yeah. It's very true. Also, it has to apply not only for horror films today. Whenever you watch something that somebody's having an operation, it now compels the filmmaker to show you the indeed the cutting of the skin and all of that. And how many times do I say, do I really need to see that? Mm -hmm. And it's like the imagination isn't allowed to progress. By the way, Rod Serling took my imagination with those shows and catapulted it into the stratosphere. It gave me as a writer the idea that there are no rules. You can write anything you want and you let your imagination fly. And as a screenwriter in Hollywood today, out there trying to sell shows and movies every day, I really have been inspired by his, his credo. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting. I didn't even realize that. Um, but the imagination has become underrated in so many ways. Uh, they don't let us, as you say, um, um, use it uh, because they will. If you're watching Grey's Anatomy, which is a great show, one of my favorites, but they will show you, you know, part of the surgery up on the screen. They'll sh they'll literally show you what's going on. Um, well, and I always, other, I always close my eyes. <laughs> actually. The other thing, the other thing, Tony, is that. Kids play video games today. They play these very elaborate video and computer games, which basically you don't have to bring any imagination to. They give you everything on a platter. And as much as I admire the video game industry and this enormous uh, infrastructure they've created and this great selling device, I think kids today 
are, are no longer need to use their imagination to create something. I mean, I've, when my kids were growing up, they would play in the living room with blocks and, and you know, and all sorts of uh, hard copy items without ever looking at a game. And they let their imagination grow wild. When I was little, I took out my to sol toy soldiers and recreated the Battle of Gettysburg. I didn't have oh, yeah. digital effects. <laughs> yeah, my brother had those toy soldiers. Did you have them, Seamus? I, I did. I didn't like them that much. I was into Lego. Lego, <laughs> Lego was my, my creative uh, outlet. Very also good. We, good. In, our, in our day, Seamus, we had Li Lincoln Logs and Tinker Toys. Oh, mm. yeah. Never heard of them. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, I, I, I was raised in Ireland, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I remember them well. My brother had a lot of those things too. And, and I have to say, I, I, I always would play with them, uh, you know, when he was not in the house. <laughs> I would play with his stuff. Well, well, it's called imaginative play. And I'll say just one more thing on the, uh, on the idea. My son had a, a friend come over to his house one day and uh, they were going to get out all the blocks and the stuff and start playing. And the voice said, where are the games? And he didn't understand the concept of imaginative play. He wanted to plug himself immediately into some kind of electronic system. Mm -hmm. And we didn't buy games for the kids when they were growing up. And I think they actually have benefited from that. I, I Again, I don't want to knock the game industry. It has its place. But I think kids have to get out in the dirt. They got to get outside and breathe the fresh air and play hide and seek and whatever. Oh, agreed. Fascinating. Yes, yes. Great. So now let's move you over to, to the 007. Uh, I mean, to meet somebody who is actually a James Bond scholar, uh, that doesn't happen often. Uh, you're probably one of the very few out there. I assume you, I mean, uh, let me actually ask you, have you read all the books as well? That's what originally inspired me. Um, I was, uh, let's see, I was uh, 11. And my father would go on business trips and he would bring back books. He was, he was a voracious Western reader, loved to read about the Old West. I had no interest in reading about the Old West because I watched it on TV every day. There were like 90 television series with cowboys. But one day in 1964, he dropped a paper book on, paperback on my desk with a naked woman on the cover. She was, <laughs> She was uh, uh, draped in gold and all of her private parts were covered. But I looked up at my father and I said, what is that? He said, you might find this interesting. So he had dropped Goldfinger on my desk. And Ooh. so all of a sudden I'm reading about these, these, this adventure involving James Bond and stealing gold from Fort Knox and these beautiful women he was spending time with. I, I was just overwhelmed. So at that time in the mid 60s, the signet paperbacks had started to appear on my fellow classmates' desks. There were all these colorful covers, the Ian Fleming Bond novels. So we were all reading the novels and that was the same year that Goldfinger was released at Christmas. So it was kind of a double whammy for me, reading the book and seeing the movie and having read all the other books. And like most of us who had, we had not seen Dr. No and From Russia with Love initially because they were released in the U.S. with very little fanfare. Goldfinger was one of the most successful movies at that time in American history and made more money faster than any movie. So they re-released the first two movies and it became a very popular double feature the following year. Um, or actually, let's see, uh, yeah, the following year. So uh, I was into it, but uh, years go by and I'm writing books and I had written a book uh, in the 80s called Combat Films, American Realism, 1945 to 1970, based on a lot of research I did in the making of World War II movies. And I sold 500 copies and I said to myself, if I'm going to be selling 500 copies of a book that took me seven years to write, I'm going to go out of business very quickly. So uh, I had to find a subject that would have a little bit of longevity and reach a broader audience. And by, by the early um, or late 70s, no one had written a behind the scenes history of James Bond. So I went to Albert R. Broccoli, the producer of the James Bond movies at that time. And I caught him on a good day. I think he was impressed with my first book. And he invited me to come to London to uh, meet his stepson, Michael G. Wilson. And they opened up all the files to me that, that summer of 1977. 
And um, I had a, a, a great time. I interviewed a lot of people. And the first book was published four, uh, four years later, the James Bond films, a behind the scenes history. And uh, that was 1981. So in, let's see, 30 years, uh, 40 years since, God, that's a little crazy. I've done five <laughs> other books on Bond, including the latest incarnation of my James Bond movie encyclopedia. Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed, I mean, because there was so many things I didn't realize. I mean, you, you give a lot of, you know, a lot of interesting stories uh, and information, you know, about, of course, the filming of the movies and the whole uh, story. Um, I, I think I wanted to focus a little bit on, and I, I'm a big reader, so I think that's why, but I wanted to focus a little bit on the, the differences between the books and the movies. Uh, I mean, I've read, I've read a few of the books, and I will say that the books are more spy-oriented, uh, if that makes sense. That's, that's the feel I get from them than, than the movies are. Well, like there, there seems to be more shooting in the in the movies and less spying, and there's more spying in the books and less shooting. Well, the author of the James Bond novels, Ian Fleming, was essentially a spy master during World War II. He was with British naval intelligence, and he would send groups of spies off onto the occupied continent of France and uh, or the occupied European continent, and he would send them on these spy adventures. So they influenced his writing. The other thing about Ian Fleming, very descriptive writer. He had cut his teeth as a field journalist for certain British newspapers in the 1930s. So if you read a James Bond novel, you really feel about where you are. I'm just actually rereading for the first time in many years, I'm rereading Dr. No right now. And you feel like you're in Jamaica when this story takes place. But the differences between the films also is the films added a certain type of light humor to them, uh, starting with what we call throwaway humor. Uh, it's evident in the first James Bond movie, Dr. No, where he's being chased by the bad guys in a hearse and they go over a cliff when James is able to dodge them. And a construction worker comes running up and says, what happened? And uh, Connery looks at uh, the construction worker and says, I think they were on their way to a funeral. Well, that's what you call throwaway humor. You know, it's like I, kind of a glib way of saying things. And uh, throughout the Connery bonds, he was special, specialized in that kind of throwaway humor. Some very funny lines uh, and even some kind of macabre lines, like when he's lying spread eagled on the table and Goldfinger about to have his private sliced in half by a laser beam he looks at Goldfinger and says do you expect me to talk and Goldfinger <laughs> looks right back and says no Mr. Bond I expect you to die <laughs> 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 that's killer stuff this killer mm. stuff and um, mm. when Roger Moore came along in 1973 uh, following the one-time appearance by George Lazenby as Bond uh, who uh, was, uh, I thought, very successful, but there's another story about that. Roger uh, lightened the humor even lower. You know, they basically, uh, I, I shouldn't say lower, I think that they heightened the humor. It became a, a strength of Roger's, because Roger was very good at, at being a light comedian. So essentially, the, the movies became a little bit funnier, a little bit more spectacular in their scope. And since then, we've gone through another incarnation. Daniel Craig, who's been James Bond since 2006, has brought it back down to very serious. The Bond movies are no longer about supervillains trying to take over the world or destroy the world. They're really, uh, I have to say, for the most part, about international terrorism, which of course is real, and how Bond fights it on the various levels. And um, I think Daniel Craig has been a great breath of fresh air to the series. I think he's brought him into the 21st century and competing well with the other series. And, you know, whereas Bond started out very much on its own, now you have to compete with Mission Impossible, the Bourne movies, uh, even to a certain extent the um, the Fast and the Furious series, even that's even though that's not really a spy series, the car stunts and all the stunts they do def definitely compete with James Bond. Do you have a favorite 
actor. I mean, most people tell you Sean Connery, but he's actually not my favorite. But do you have a favorite? Well, it's axiomatic that you love the Bond you grew up with. So I grew up with uh-huh. Connery. So he's my Bond. But I've become such a fan of Daniel Craig's. He's right up there, too. Even when Daniel Craig's movies are not as good, and I consider Quantum of Solace and Spectre to be not really terrific Bond movies in terms of what I like to see, he's great. So you never keep, uh, you never stray away too far because you've always got Daniel Craig in the bullpen. What about the David Niven playing the retired Bond? Well, that isn't, that's not considered an official Bond movie. No? Uh, Okay. Casino, Roy- Casino Royale uh, was the one title. It was actually the title of, of Ian Fleming's first James Bond novel. But when Albert R. Broccoli and his partner, Harry Saltzman, acquired the series in 1961, that book was not available. It was owned at that time. Uh, well, it was owned by a number of people. But Charles K. Feldman, a top Hollywood agent, got the rights. And uh, he couldn't get Connery because Connery was under contract. So with, without anybody to compete with Connery, he decided to do a spoof. And that's what Casino Royale was in 1967. It was just a big spoof. Wow. I, you know, I didn't realize that. <laughs> well, neither did the public because uh, Albert R. Broccoli told me the, re- the, the reason their Bond entry that year, You Only Live Twice, didn't do that well, is a lot of people thought Casino Royale was the official entry. And they oh. kind of boot hissed it because it wasn't what they were looking for. Although, if you watch it today, it's it's kind of a a big goofball movie. I mean, I mean, how many movies have Peter Sellers, Woody Allen, and David Niven in the same movie? I mean, it's insane. Fair enough. What about Pierce Pierce Brosnan? Nobody ever talks about Pierce Brosnan as the as Bond. Well. I'm a big Pierce Brosnan fan. Dating so am back I. Actually, Remington. he's my favorite. <laughs> well, dating back to Remington Steele. I thought he was terrific. The only thing I'll say about his four films is that the writing was a little bit up and down on them. Um, a lot of people disparage his last entry, Die Another Day. Invisible cars kind of jump the shark, things like that. But I would argue his fight sequence in that fencing club in London where he battles the bad guy was the best fight I've seen in the Bond movies since Connery duped it out with Robert Shaw and from Russia with Love. That's a great scene. Yeah, you really believe those guys are about to kill each other with swords. And I, I, I love that scene. So do I. It's a great scene. And, and that's why I said he's actually my favorite Bond. Nobody agrees with me. Anyone I've ever said that to thinks I'm insane. He's the least credited. Um, well, actually, the least credited is George Lazenby. <laughs> that's no, no uh, okay. respect. But uh, Lazenby, I was just going to tell you, Lazenby was the one who replaced Sean Connery. And um, I didn't even know he existed. I didn't even know that he was a Bond. Connery finally decided he wanted to leave the series. So they conducted a worldwide search and they found an Australian actor named George Lazenby, who talked himself, talked his way into the audition uh, by saying he'd made a number of films in Eastern Europe and he looked great. I mean, George Lazenby was definitely Bond. And uh, when they started to prep shooting, uh, he went up to director uh, Peter Hunt, who was going to be obviously his director, and confessed that he never did any movies. He lied about everything. His only claim to fame that day was he did one commercial where he lifted a giant chocolate bar on his shoulders and carried it on stage. So uh, Peter Hunt almost had a heart attack when he found out his lead actor had virtually no experience. And given that he had no experience, you have to look at George Lazenby's performance as Bond and see that it's it's pretty extraordinary. I don't think I've seen that one. Was he only in one? It's on, yes, On Her Majesty's Secret Service was Peter Hunt's directing debut. He had edited the first five Bond movies. So it was kind of the gift that Broccoli and Saltzman gave to him. But, uh, and it's, it's the most carefully produced of the Bond movies in terms of relating to the original novel, very close to the novel. It's the one movie where he falls in love with uh, Tracy the, the Countess, and that's portray- she's portrayed by Diana Rigg, who comes to the Bond series in 1969 after winning everybody's hearts in The Avengers. 
I have to, I have to say your enthusiasm and love has me so fascinated. I wanted to watch every movie again. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, I, you know, I'm sure when you meet a Shakespearean scholar and they start talking about Romeo and Juliet or somebody's debating uh, Proust or Kafka, mm. they bring the same enthusiasm. But I've been, I've been, well, I've been watching Bonds for over 50 years. I've been writing about Bonds 40 years. It's kind of in my blood. I, I can't be, mm. I'm, I'm so looking forward to the new movie, which of course has been postponed four times. Yes. And, and I, I, I went to my, uh, I did some acting with Tony and some other people and, and uh, end up going to film school in Berkeley across, I live in, in San Francisco actually. And uh, my friend Patrick Krewenek uh, introduced me to filmmaking, which was scientific. And there was, there was a science to it. And I've no come to notice that everything's successful. There is actually a science to it. Have you noticed the science to the Bond uh, series? Well, over the years, there's been kind of a somewhat formula. You know, Bond usually is involved in, with at least three women, one of whom becomes his main squeeze. That hasn't changed much over the years. <laughs> yeah. uh, interestingly, the formula has changed a little bit because they've become less sexy and more violent. As Tony points out, there's a lot more shooting going on now, a lot more mm. violence. It reflects cinema in general. There's no subtlety anymore. Uh, you know, so I think that, if, and the sexiness has to be kind of controlled. There's a scene in Goldfinger at the beginning of the movie where Felix Leiter arrives in Miami and Bond is on a masseuse's table and um, the lady is massaging him and then he, he says he can't talk to her now because he's got to talk to Felix. So he swats her on the bottom and says, man talk. If they did that in a movie today, they would be protested from here to <laughs> Dublin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what yeah. about Bond women? I mean, there have been, so you have a favorite of all the Bond women? Oh yeah, of course, of course. Oh, my, favorite, I, my favorite Bond woman is in the fourth Bond movie, Thunderball. It's uh, French actress Claudine Auger who plays Domino, Domino Durval, and just the stunning beauty, uh, entirely revoiced, by the way. Um, in fact, in the early Bond movies, a lot of the women are revoiced uh, uh, for various reasons. But yes, uh, Domino is my favorite. Wow. So you mean like another actress did actually did the speaking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It starts on the first Bond movie. Ursula Andres played the first Bond girl in Dr. Yeah. No very famous coming out of the water in this white bikini considered right, right. the most the most famous debut for an actress in film history by the way and uh she was revoiced also by the same actress who revoiced uh um claudine auger her name is nikki vanderzil she was married to leslie brickis the british uh, uh lyricist that's like in the singing in the rain movies right the the actress who supposedly was his main squeeze in the silent movies once they added voice to it she had a terrible voice so they brought somebody else in to literally voice her character well it's funny because in the movie debbie reynolds revoices gene hagan the right. uh, yes yes lena <laughs> lamont character but i heard i'm not 100 percent sure about this i heard that gene hagan actually does a little bit of her voicing at times too so it's kind of in the real life, the actress who's getting revoiced as a character does her own revoicing. So it's a little funny. But, uh, <laughs> that is funny. I haven't heard you, that. You mentioned one of my favorite movies. I mean, Singing in the Rain. I just, uh, you know, it's just about as far away from James Bond as you can get. But it's one of my favorites. Me too. That I remember watching growing up. My mom was a huge uh huge Gene Kelly fan, so I watch it and dance around. You know, I just I just it. watched one of his films for the first time. Have you ever seen The Pirate? I have seen The Pirate. I've seen yeah. most of Gene Kelly's stuff. Yeah, just just extraordinary, just extraordinary. So tell us now. I, I mean, because you're the most familiar, I think, with every single movie, you're in the best place to grade them for us. What's the best Bond film ever made? Okay, so. Um, Obviously, on a one-star to four-star system, I give uh, four stars to Goldfinger, the third James Bond movie, and I give four stars to Casino Royale, the first Daniel Craig movie. 
but there are other Bond movies that are close to that for me. From Rush with Love and Dr. No are pretty close. I would give them three and a half stars. And I would also give Skyfall, the third Daniel Craig, three and a half stars. And then generally, they all pretty much get three stars from me. All of the Pierce Brosnans, I find three star movies. But there are a few dogs in the group, unfortunately. Um, uh, the low point for me was the last Roger Moore film, A View to a Kill. I give that two. It, really? What, what yeah. made that one so terrible? It just... Um, it, it was a cake that didn't rise. It just, the plot was kind of a remake of Goldfinger. Instead of dominating or gathering all the gold, uh, it's all about microchips. And nobody cares about microchips. It's kind of an inane plot. Uh, he, Christopher Walken was good. He played a good psychotic villain. But I just... I just didn't like the movie. Uh, Tanya Roberts played the main woman and she's gorgeous, but they outfitted her in the most un un unattractive outfits I've ever seen in a, a Bond girl, you know, long gowns, uh, coveralls. It's like they were hiding her figure, which I thought was a mistake. Not my favorite. Now, I'm wondering if you know this information, but were the screenwriters required to read the novel? before they well, wrote the movie. Well, first of all, they have not based James Bond movies on an Ian Fleming novel for many decades now. The last, the last James Bond movie to really be based on a Ian Fleming novel would have to be The Man with the Golden Gun, uh, which goes back to 1974. So we're talking 30, 47 years ago. Um, they, I wonder they, why, though. I mean, because you can. Why not just stop? He wrote so many of them. Why not? Just but he didn't. He didn't write that many of them, Tony. He only wrote thirteen when two sets of sto short stories. So they ran out back in the seventies. And uh, as you point out, the books are different from the movies, and they had to come up with new material. For instance, the Spy Who Loved Me, which was released in nineteen seventy seven, is based on an Ian Fleming novel, but it's based on a novel that you could not make a movie out of. Ian Fleming's novel, The Spy Who Loved Me, is about a woman traveling on the east coast of the United States who stops off at a motel and is terrorized by these two bad guys. James Bond doesn't come into the story until like the last 40 pages to save her. So that was not a good move, uh, idea for a movie. So if you watch The Spy Who Loved Me, they had to reinvent the wheel. And I think they had something like 12 or 14 writers to create the story they came up with, which at the end of the day is almost a remake of You Only Live Twice. In You, in you, in you Only Live Twice, the Spectre organization is capturing Russian and American spaceships in outer space and trying to start World War III. In The Spy Who Love, uh, the super tanker is capturing Russian and American nuclear submarines and starting to, trying to start uh, World War III. So at the end of the day, they almost remade their own movie. Don't you think, though, there would be something to it if the screenwriter still had to read the, the novels before starting, even if even if you have said read the first three? Um, don't you think that would add something to the creating of the movie? Well, I'm not saying they don't read it. I'm just saying that they don't base it on anything. But yes, no, the writers generally will read will read the books to get the flavor of Bond. And I think you definitely need that flavor. But I would argue that by watching the 25 movies in the series, uh, you get enough flavor from just watching the various guys doing Bond. So what's your most, and I, I know I always ask this to everybody, but what's your most memorable behind the scenes story from the Bond movies? Wow. Um, <laughs> There's some really outrageous things that have happened during the making of the Bond movies. I mean, for instance, the, the car in Goldfinger, the famous Aston Martin, which has now become a regular character in a lot of new Bond movies. Aston Martin wouldn't give them a free car. They had to actually go to Aston Martin and purchase three cars for Goldfinger, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. And in this day and age when product placement becomes crazy, you, uh, you, you, early on, nobody knew what Bond was. The other thing about James Bond, the novels were not selling. In fact, in England, the, the book sales were so 
down that uh, Ian Fleming thought of killing Bond off. He was kind of tired of the disappointment. So at the end of um, the end of From Rush to a Love, James mm -hmm. Bond is kicked in the foot by Rosa Club with a poison dart. And for all intents and purposes, Bond's dead. And um, what happened was Raymond Chandler, the famous American mystery author, was a good friend of Fleming's. And apparently he convinced him to keep writing James Bond novels. So Bond comes back in Dr. No. Mm. Wow. Well, we're out of time today. I'm sorry, because I feel like this conversation could just go on and on. <laughs> and <laughs> there's so much to cover. There's so many interesting you know, facts about the, the, the movie, uh, the movie genre in general, but even James Bond between the books and the movies and the Twilight Zone, you definitely focused in some fascinating areas. Well, thank you. Thank you. And listen, anytime you ever want to talk movies, any genre, um, I'm there to talk to you because I spent a lot of time researching a lot of different things, not just James Bond. In fact, um, this, I spent six months once with the kids who all played the characters in The Sound of Music, the famous Von Trapp kids. Oh, the, wow. the actors who played all the Von Trapps, I tracked them all down in the 80s and did a whole thing on the making of that. And then I'm, I'm very much into science fiction as well. My, my mm. start in the business pretty much in addition to doing publicity was I was a staff writer for Cine Fantastique magazine out of Chicago. Wow. And I specialized in the 1950s. I, I was the first researcher to do behind the scenes studies of films like The Day the Earth Stood Still, Forbidden Planet, War of the Worlds. Wow. Okay, By, yeah. by the way, Tony, I have, to, I have to ask you this. I'm not sure you get asked this enough, but uh, are you stopped on the street? Do, do people think you're Tina Fey? Oh, I definitely don't look anything like Tina Fey. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, but and, I she and Seamus looks like an actor. Seamus, do you act? I do a little acting, a little bit of acting. And uh, I just got into sc screen making, screen writing. But uh, I, I uh, was going to say to you, uh, I had my question and now it's gone. I had a question about, oh. Isn't it all, is this always the case? And I was an ex-professional boxer, big time world ranked in, in the world and won a lot of fights and a lot of publicity that way. I got into acting after, after boxing. But my experience has been the backstory is so much more interesting often than, than the front story. I agree. I agree. I do a lot of commentary work. Uh, since I have this uh, interest in, in war pictures, my friend Steve Mitchell and I do the commentaries on Blu-ray re Blu releases. We just mm -hmm. did uh, the movie that Gregory Peck starred in in 1976 called, uh, 77 called MacArthur. We're doing Midway. Uh, we've done The Devil's Brigade. We're doing The Great Escape. And there's always great stories about how these movies were put together. That was the one that the things that inspired me to write my books, because you're absolutely right. The behind the scenes story is much more interesting than the, the real story. For instance, my all time favorite movie is the Steve McQueen, uh, James Garner, World War II prisoner of war camp movie, The Great Escape, where mm. he rides the motorcycle. Yeah. And yeah. I, I've, I've researched that. I've done two documentaries on it. And I discovered in my research that Steve McQueen was so dissatisfied with his character because everybody in that movie, if you recall, has a job. You know, James Coburn is the manufacturer. Yeah. Charles Bronson's the tunnel guy. Steve McQueen just goes to the, the jail cell every two minutes, you know, bouncing <laughs> that baseball. So he yeah. refused to work. He refused to work for six weeks. He sat in his hotel room. So John Sturgis, the film director, fired him. And they were going to replace him, his job with James Garner. And his agents came running out from Hollywood. And they ended up coming up with a compromise. They wrote a sequence into the movie where mm. Steve McQueen agrees to escape from the camp and make maps for them so that he can come back and show them how to get out of town. And so that's how we got Steve McQueen. We almost lost Steve McQueen in probably the most famous role for an actor at that time. Wow. Well, I guess everyone needs a purpose, don't they? Everyone needs a purpose. Everyone needs a purpose. Exactly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank yeah, absolutely. You You're welcome. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. your questions were great.
And please mm -hmm. come back. We definitely will have more questions for you. So please do come back. I will be there. I'm going to go watch as many Bond movies as I can. <laughs> <laughs> You've inspired Seamus. <laughs> Start with the first one. Put on Dr. No immediately. Okay. Okay. Well, I will. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank okay, you. guys.